I'm Anthony L. Elmore, President and Founder of the Proud Black Buddhist World Association. We at the Proud Black Buddhist World Association is the Black Buddhist Voice in America. We'd like to bring you some exciting Buddhist teachings. And my lecture today is called Buddhism Intellectual Realm. Buddhism is not just about meditation. Buddhism is about education. This is what I'm confident of. There is no Japanese or white man that can explain Buddhism to black people better than other black people. I am black and I understand the black culture and I can get into deep Buddhist theory and I can explain Buddhism black style. Now, Nitrin Shonen writes in the Go Show. Now, the Go Show is called The True Aspect of All Phenomena. And this is what Nitrin writes. He says, quote, Be sure to strengthen your faith and receive the protection of Shakyamuni, many treasures, and the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. He goes on further. Exert yourself in the two ways of practice and study. Without practice and study, there can be no Buddhism. He goes on further. You must not only persevere yourself, you must also teach others. Both practice and study arise from faith. Teach others to the best of your ability, even if it is only a single sentence or phrase. Unquote. See, Nitra Shonen teaches us to exert ourselves in practice and study. He also admonishes us to teach others to the best of our ability. Now, what we want to do, or what we at the Proud Black Buddhists want to do, we want to create an intellectual culture, a culture whereas we're discussing Buddhism, we're teaching Buddhism, and we want to be intellectually sound about our teachings and the doctrines of Buddhism. This is why we need black voices, we need black teachers. If Buddhism is going to penetrate the African American community, then we must have black teachers. And those of you who are out there, we encourage you to study the doctrines of Buddhism. Look outside the realm of the parameters of organizations like the SGI, Nichiren Shoshu, and Nichiren Shu. But read the teachings of Nichiren Shonen for yourself. There's a ghost show called The Doctrine of the 3000 Realms. Now, Nitrin writes, quote, The forms and appearances that are manifested in the hundred worlds all represent the principle of temporary existence and hence pertain to the truth of temporary existence. The thousand factors all represent the principle of non-substantiality and hence pertain to the truth of non-substantiality. The 3,000 realms all represent the principle of the Dharma body, hence pertain to the truth of the mental way. You see, life is non-substantial in that everything is moving. In Buddhism it's called Keita, Kuta, and Chuta or you got three realms of existence. See, everything in the universe is moving. Everything goes to what we call in Buddhism called Joju, A, and Ku, or everything goes to birth, growth, maturity, and death. See, everything is constantly moving and everything is in flux. So when we look at things in the universe, we may see ourselves the way we look today, but actually in our bodies. For example, in your body, cells, cells are they're born, they grow, they mature, and they die. 
as you're born, you're headed toward death because everything, there's an interrelatedness between life and phenomena. Buddhism explains this by virtue of the Lotus Sutra and it explains in ten ties, it's an insanity or 3,000 3, worlds in a momentary state of existence because life is in flux. But let's take it further. Now, in the same Go Show, Nitrin writes, with regard to threefold contemplation in a single mind, the other schools of Buddhism take it to be equivalent to the word noze, which means thusness or suchness. But this is in error because it fails to account for the two principles of what? Non-substantiality and temporary existence. They make this error because they do not understand the interpretation set forward by Tentai and Na Yue. In our school, we follow the interpretation set forth in the commentaries of Tentai, which gives three readings to each of the ten factors. Reading them three times, we produce great benefit. The first reading, say no, this is, this appearance is thus, indicate that each of the ten factors, such as appearance, nature, entity, power, is thus. Here the word no, or thus, represents the principle of non-substantiality, and for this reason we know that all ten worlds are characterized by the truth of non-substantiality. Now, for those of you who are coming in the middle of this and don't know anything about Buddhism, see, the Lotus Sutra explains that we live in 3,000 worlds in a momentary state of existence. Now, in the momentary state of existence, that's what is called the ten aspects. All phenomena has what? An appearance, a nature, and an entity. So an appearance, a nature, and an entity creates what is a power, which is four, and a power creates an influence. And an influence comes because of an inherent cause. An inherent cause comes because, because of a relationship. And a relationship comes because of a latent effect. And a latent effect happens because of a manifest effect. And a manifest effect happens because of a consistent to beginning to end. So what happens, you have ten worlds that we live in, and each world is existent in each world. So there's ten worlds times ten, which is a hundred worlds times ten aspects, which is a thousand worlds. So a thousand worlds times the three realms. Now the three realms are the realms of the five components. Now the realm, so the realms of the five components is number one. You got that, and the realm of the five components is this. Every phenomena has a, what, an appearance, then there's a preception, a conception, a volition, and a consciousness. Then you got the world of living beings, and then you got the environment. So what happens is, this is the theory of it's an insanity. Now, please understand that all Buddhist teachings are not alike. The only true Buddhist teachings is the Lotus Sutra, because the Lotus Sutra deals with the concept of non-substantiality. Now, in 2012, scientists discovered what is called the Higgs boson that is better known as the guard particle. See, in the view of life, we look at life that says nothingness. See, in Buddhism, or in non-substantiality, there is no such thing as emptiness or nothingness because even when you look out into space, there is an energy field that actually there are particles that's not matter, that's not energy, but it is a field. The field of cause and effect exists in all phenomena. Now this is called Myo. Now, Buddhism gets quite complicated, so what I want to do I want to first of all show you a one minute video 
that explains the Higgs boson concept. And let's look at this. That kind of gives you an idea, and we're going to get more into the Buddhist concept of non-substantiality. Let's watch the video first. Higgs boson is the last fundamental piece of the standard model of particle physics to be discovered experimentally. But you might ask, why was the Higgs boson included in the standard model alongside well-known particles like electrons and photons and quarks if it hadn't been discovered back then in the 1970s? Good question. There are two main reasons. First, just like the electron is an excitation in the electron field, the Higgs boson is simply a particle which is an excitation of the everywhere permeating Higgs field. The Higgs field, in turn, plays an integral role in our model for the weak nuclear force. In particular, the Higgs field helps explain why it's so weak. We'll talk more about this in a later video, but even though weak nuclear theory was confirmed in the 1980s, in the equations, the Higgs field is so inextricably jumbled with the weak force that until now we've been unable to confirm its actual and independent existence. The second reason to include the Higgs in the standard model is some jargony business about the Higgs field giving other particles mass. But why does stuff need to be given mass in the first place? Isn't mass just an intrinsic property of matter, like electric charge? Well, in particle physics, no. Remember that in the standard model, we first write down a mathematical ingredients list of all the particles that we think are in nature, and their properties. You can watch my Theory of Everything video for a quick refresher. We then run this list through a big fancy mathematical machine, which spits out equations that tell us how these particles behave. Except, if we try to include mass as a property for the particles on our ingredients list, the math machine breaks. Maybe mass was a poor choice. But most particles we observe in nature do have mass, so we have to figure out some clever way of using ingredients that will spit out mass in the final equations without it being an input. Kind of like how you can let yeast, sugar, and water ferment into alcohol that wasn't there to begin with. And as you may be thirstily anticipating, the solution is to toss a yeasty Higgs field in with the other ingredients of the standard model, so that when we let the math ferment, we get out particles that have mass. But this model also brews up something we didn't intend, a solitary Higgs particle, the infamous boson. And since the model works so well to explain everything else, we figured it was pretty likely that the lonely boson is right, too. To summarize, the Higgs boson is a particle which is a leftover excitation of the Higgs field, which in turn was needed in the standard model to 1. explain the weak nuclear force, and 2. explain why any of the other particles have mass at all. However, the boson is the only bit of the Higgs field which is independently verifiable, precisely because the other bits are tangled up in the weak nuclear force and in giving particles mass. The fact that the Higgs boson is so independent from the rest of the standard model is why it's the last piece of the puzzle to be discovered. And if it turns out to be exactly what was predicted, the standard model will be complete. The only problem is that we know the standard model isn't a complete description of the universe. It entirely misses out on gravity, for example. So to physicists, it would be much more interesting and helpful if the Higgs boson turns out to be not quite what we expect. Then we might get a clue as to how to reach a deeper understanding of the universe. So even though we just made a discovery, we can't sit back and relax. We need a hint, Mr. Higgs. When we look at the universe, we see that we explain an empty space or nothingness. In the eye of the Buddha, there is no such thing as empty space or nothingness. Particle physics does not contain matter. We know matter as anything that has size, shape, weight, and takes up space. In the universe is a field called the Higgs boson, whereas a field of what is nothingness emerges as matter. Scientists discover this field and it's called the Higgs boson. Now, what they call a Higgs field, we in Buddhism call non-substantiality. The ghost show, that's called on 18 perfections. It reads, quote, These five types of visions are the Buddha eye, which is Myo, the Dharma eye, which is Ho, the wisdom eye, which is Ren, the heavenly eye, which is Gay, and the eye of ordinary mortals, which is Kyo. Now, Myo means inconceivable, and therefore it corresponds to true non-substantiality and tranquility, which is the Buddha eye. Ho is design discrimination, designated discrimination, and therefore it corresponds to the Dharma I, which is temporary in nature and embodies discrimination. The wisdom I corresponds to non-substantiality, being the embodiment of effects 
and it is represented by red. Gay represents function, therefore is designed the heavenly eye, which is the function of conversion exercised by transcendental powers. Kyo means to smash delusion, and because it deals with delusion, it is designed, designate, designed, designated the eye of ordinary people. Now, let us look at non-substantiality in a different way. Now, non-existence of self-nature means that there is no independent entity that exists alone apart from other phenomena. The common message is that the true nature of all phenomena is non-substantiality and that it cannot be defined in terms of in terms of the concepts of existence and non-existence. Nagarjuna explained it as the middle way, a perspective that regards the categories of existence and non-existence as extremes and aims to transcend them. The practical purpose behind the teachings of non-substantiality lies in eliminating attachment to transit phenomena and to the ego or the perception of self as independent of a fixed identity. Now, that gets kind of complicated. Now, in the Go Show, it's called On Attaining Buddhahood, Nitrin kind of breaks non-substantiality down this way. He says, what does Myo signify? It's simply the mysterious nature of our life from moment to moment, which the mind cannot comprehend or words express. When we look into our own minds at any moment, we perceive neither color nor form to verify that it exists. Yet, we still cannot say it does not exist, for many different thoughts continually occur. The mind cannot be considered either to exist or not exist. Life is indeed an elusive reality that transcends both words and concepts of existence and non-existence. It is neither existence nor non-existence, yet exhibits qualities of both. It is the mystic entity of the middle way that is the ultimate reality. Myo is the name given to the mystic nature of life and whole its manifestations. Renge, which means lotus flower, is used to symbolize the wonder of this law. If we understand that our life at this moment is myo, then we will also understand that our life at other moments is the mystic law. This realization is the mystic kyo or sutra. The Lotus Sutra is the king of sutras, the direct path to enlightenment, for it explains that the entity of our life, which manifests either good or evil at each moment, is in fact the entity of the mystic law. Unquote. Now, also in the Go Show on attaining Buddhahood in his lifetime, it reads, quote, If the minds of living beings are impure, their land is also impure. But if the minds are pure, so is their land. There are not two lands pure or impure in themselves. The difference lies solely in the good or evil of our minds. It is the same with the Buddha and an ordinary being. When deluded, one is called an ordinary being. When enlightened, one is called a Buddha. This is similar to a tarnished mirror that would shine like a jewel when polished. 
A mind now clouded by illusions of any darkness of life is like a tarnished mirror. But when polished, it is sure to become like a clear mirror reflecting the essential nature of phenomena and the true aspect of reality. Arouse deep faith and digitally, diligently polish your mirror day and night. How should you polish it? Only by chanting Namu Naho Renge Kyo. Now, in the Go Show, it's called the Gift of Rights. Now, this is what Nitrin teaches us. In the Gift of Rights, he says, the true path lies in the fires of this world. The Golden Light Sutra states, quote, to have a profound knowledge of this world is itself Buddhism. He goes on further. The Nirvana Sutra states all of the non-Buddhist scriptures and writings of society are themselves Buddhist teachings, not non-Buddhist teachings. He goes on further. He says, when the great teacher Milo compared these passages with the one from the sixth volume of the Lotus Sutra that reads, quote, no world of files of life or work are ever contrary to the true reality. He revealed that meanings and pointed out that although the first two sutras are profound, since their meanings is still shallow and fail to approach that of the Lotus Sutra, they relate to secular matters in terms of Buddhism, whereas the Lotus Sutra explains that in the end, secular matters are the entirety of Buddhism. Unquote. Now, non-substantiality teaches us that there is an interrelatedness of life and all phenomena. We are connected as one. To black people, specifically the Buddhist sect, the SGI, Nichiren Shoshu, Nichiren Shu, these Buddhist sects purposefully extricate all black culture, history, and language from the Buddhist teachings. You do not get a clear picture of the Buddhist teacher from the Asians or the Japanese. Now, I'm going to put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, from the standpoint of a black man who knows his history and who makes Buddhism inclusive of our history, culture, and language. Let me bring it to you in a clear and concise way. Now, on April the 16th, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King wrote a letter from the Birmingham jail. Dr. Martin Luther King understood the Buddhist concept of interrelatedness of life in our environment. He wrote this in 1963, and this is what Dr. Martin Luther King wrote. Now the Japanese are not going to tell you this, because they're going to have you thinking that Buddhism is outside your everyday life and they're not going to give credit to our great teachers who can teach us about life and teach us about Buddhism or they're not going to include Dr. Martin Luther King. But Dr. Anthony F. Elmore teaches a Buddhism inclusive of our black history and culture. Now, this is what Dr. King wrote and he goes straight to Buddhism. He says, quote, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. All men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. This is what I'm most proud of is the fact that we can explain Buddhism inclusive of black culture. Dr. Martin Luther King hit it on the button because he tied in the interrelated relationship of life and all phenomena and all people. Let me bring this to your close. I am Anthony F. Elmore, President and Founder of the Proud Black Buddhist World Association, bringing you a Black Buddhist lecture, Buddhism's Intellectual Realm. 
Thank you very much.